So I wonder, for, for the introduction, could you give our audience a joke? Just a joke? Just, just right, a just... joke, yes. On the spot, Greg McKeown, do you have a joke for us? <laughs> yeah, I love that you started with that. That's, uh, nobody has ever started that way before. <laughs> Uh, nope. <laughs> Apparently, I can't. <laughs> not funny on command. Uh, not, not funny on demand. Uh, maybe just not funny. This is uh, this is what we're discovering here. <laughs> You'll have to make up for it throughout the interview. I, I man, when I was listening to your other podcast, I was laughing at loads of the things you were saying. I thought like, this what, guy's what did you find funny. Trip. I think it was uh, I think it was this this podcast you with the health I think it was called the health podcast and you you were saying these things and you were laughing at your own jokes and I was <laughs> laughing with you and they were just dead silent I was like that is funny <laughs> well they might not have been listening may not have been you know sometimes been. sometimes people are so busy just with a preset of questions that they're not actually listening to what's being said I just started my own podcast as I mentioned to you and uh and I found it interesting just to have a conversation with people mm. uh, rather than okay here's my list of questions and I've got to get through them and uh, sometimes when people are doing that they just wait until I stop talking and then they just then they just ask the next question they're not really having a conversation at all I notice sometimes mm. how are you finding the weird and wacky world of podcasting so far uh, yeah, my first one was a disaster. Really? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I had, um, you know, I was trying to do video and audio. I didn't even have a microphone at that time. Getting a microphone was like, you know, I don't know, it was like undercover operations to be able to go and pick this up from somewhere. And when would it arrive? And did it arrive by, you know, taking five days and then they don't know if they have it. I mean, it's like, it's like trying to, trying to smuggle stuff out of uh, out of Cuba or something, just getting yourself <laughs> a microphone in these environments. And then, and then the, the, the person, I won't say who it is, because they won't actually be the first podcast, but they were so, they'd done so many times and uh, I just wasn't well prepared for them. And so the combination of so many new things happening at the same time and the audio not being good and me not knowing what I was doing, yeah, it was not a... It was not a beautiful first moment, uh, you know. But I, but really, what I found is you have to have the courage to be rubbish. Uh, I love at that. anything because you're going to have to be rubbish at some point if you want to learn and ever get competent or you know even excellent at something. Man, have you? Uh, do you know Robert Green? Have you heard of Robert Green? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. He, uh, you know, he was on the show. You know, real. He went five years without doing any interviews whilst he was writing his book. Yeah, he was in monk mode. Yeah, he was in complete monk mode. He comes on the show, we're about 45 minutes in, and his publicist keeps ringing him. Right. <laughs> Obviously, Robert Green, he's the guy that wrote, you know, the 48 Laws of Power. So yeah. me and my co-host, and Robert's like, man, I'm getting emotional with this phone, you know, that keeps going off. <laughs> so Robert picks up this phone with his publicist, and he's like, look, stop bringing me I'm in the middle of an interview. And, and me, my co-host, Lewis, and me, we like sat there and we're just like looking at each other. We're like, and then Robert goes to this guy, he goes, I've warned you, now don't call me again. And we're like, oh my God. <laughs> Man, we're like, that I was like. I warned you, <laughs> leave me alone. You could, you could set that up, couldn't you? You can have somebody call you in every podcast just to show, you know, just to show how like, look, never call me again. I'm talking. <laughs> Oh, and that's what I, that's the priority right now. I'm done. I don't need a publicist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't need a publicist. I'm out. <laughs> Man, to be fair, though, I mean, I looked at your Twitter and it seems like, you know, you're aiming big. I saw a, a, a reach out for Joe Rogan. So it seems like you are reaching for the stars with this. <laughs> yeah, well, look, asymmetric risk. Oh, absolutely. Uh, right, so reaching out. See, searching out significant goals, contributions, uh, minimum, minimal uh, downside, mm. almost unlimited possible upside. Right. Uh, so far, it's been amazing, actually. We're, the people that have 
signed up uh, and, and immediately have been, I mean, sort of my dream list of people. Uh, people I've, I've read their books or I've been influenced by them and I just, uh, I've done quite a few, just tweets out to people and people sometimes live right there. Oh yes, I'll be on, fantastic, let's do it. Uh, sometimes they're direct messaging me afterwards or, I mean, it's just been, it's been a fun adventure. And, and I definitely feel, uh, I feel in my element doing it, even though it's funny to say that after having just said I felt you know, rubbish at the beginning, but still what's carrying me into it is just the, the, the desire to be having these hopefully meaningful conversations with people I think are themselves really interesting right. uh, and grappling with the question, like what is essential? What really matters? Why does it matter? And to try and get our heads back to that question again and again, because so many things in life pull us off that question into other, you know, more trivial uh, subjects and questions. Definitely. And I think it's a great place to bridge your book, Essentialism, into this conversation with the podcast. And one of the things in which um, I was thinking about in this discussion about podcasts is I think the one of the principles that you know, our team and myself, we go by with this is we begin, we want to begin with the end in mind, right? So as I said to you, this is, we want to create the product that we wish existed. Unfortunately, you know, as you get deeper and deeper into product land, as you, into podcast land, as the downloads start increasing, it becomes a bit more complicated. You know, you get publicists reaching out to you, people saying, can I come on and promote my course? And, you know, and, and, you know, guests say, can my friend come on? And you think, ah, you know, so I think coming back to that idea of beginning with the end in mind, that's been a real guiding principle. And in this book, the story which gave me goosebumps was when you documented an encounter that you had with Cynthia. Yeah, yeah. So I was talking to Cynthia and she told me a story. Uh, she's, you know, she's. I don't know, age-wise, maybe 50, 60 years old, telling me the story uh, about when she was, um, I can't remember now, but 10 or 12 years old. And she'd been looking forward to this weekend. She was going to get with her dad uh, in San Francisco. He was going to be at a, a conference all day and she would stay at the hotel. And then she would meet her at, at the end of this event. And they had planned everything uh, minute by minute. Uh, they were going to go watch a movie. They were going to go into Chinatown and, uh, and, and eat Chinese meal, a favorite meal. They were going to then go get ice cream. They're going to go back to the hotel room, order food service there and eat, eat ice cream again, or cookies, whatever, and then watch another movie. They had the whole thing laid out and they've been looking forward to it for a long time, especially she had, because this one-on-one -on -one time, of course, is immensely valuable. And, and it's exciting and it's not just the doing of a thing, it's the anticipation of it. And so they've been building this together. So the day arrives and everything's going according to plan and to, at least through the day, they, they meet at the end of the conference. And she meets her dad and is about to walk out of the conference center. Um, she told me that her dad, uh, friends from years ago, you know, like longtime friends, and his wife had surprised him and said, my goodness, we couldn't believe it that you were at this conference and we're so excited to, uh, to be here. Uh, and and, to, to, and we, just, we just absolutely want you. And oh my goodness, here's your daughter as well. Bring her with you. We'd love to, uh, we'll take you to a, you know, an extraordinary seafood uh, meal overlooking uh, the, the, the harbor. And this will just, we'll have a wonderful time. And when Cynthia tells me this story, she says that in that moment, her heart just sinks. She doesn't like seafood anyway. But also what she realized was that as soon as this plan changed, she would just be there for the ride. The conversation isn't with her. Um, it's going to be adult conversation and she's just an afterthought. Uh, and so she just goes, okay, well, it's ruined. And then she said, my dad looked at them and said, it's so nice that you're here. I love that you're here. I'm so happy to see you. But every minute 
is already scheduled and spoken for. So we just have to take a rain check. We just have to do this later. And he grabbed a hand and he ran out the door and they went and did every part of their plan as had originally been organized. And so here she's telling me this now. Her father has passed away. It's the story that she told at his funeral. And she knew in that moment that he really thought she mattered, that she was essential, that this relationship was vital. Uh, you know, the, the, I suppose the kicker, the little reveal on this is that uh, this is Cynthia Covey and her father is Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, a mentor to me before he passed away. And, and really, it meant a lot to me to hear her tell that story and to, sing, to, to curate that out of all the experiences of her life with her father as being defining. And what's brilliant about that story is that we all have that opportunity. We can get clear about what is essential. We can invest in what is essential and we can therefore, because we're so clear on that, either eliminate or negotiate or reduce all the non-essentials so that we can actually live a life that really matters and not leave those essential activities and relationships uninvested in at the end. That, that, that's a pretty great value proposition. Yeah. When you say that Covey was a mentor, was this, did you actually meet him person to person in real life or, or do you yeah, mean more? Yeah, yeah. Really? Lots of times, yeah. Wow. Um, and uh, and talked to him on the phone often as well. And uh, it, it it was um, yeah. When I was when I was I I'd quit law school mm. years ago, as I'm sure you know. And and then came to the United States to to teach and write. That was my focus. That's what I wanted to do instead of studying law. And uh, and so I was. I felt full of a mission sense of mission uh, and I still feel it now um, the, 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 the flavor of the mission has changed the, the taste of it has changed as I reflect on that right now but but the, the depth of it the strength of it has certainly not diminished and I remember so even when I was just university as at BYU at, at great and, and he was lived close to there and so I looked him up and, and I remember the first time I like met with him in person, I said, you know, something along the lines of, look, I just really want to write. I want to teach and I want to write a book. And I must have been, I don't know, I was 22 or something at the time. And, and he said, uh, so oh, Greg, he said, um, he said, uh, you, you just haven't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> he said you don't even know what you don't know uh you know <laughs> and i'm like well that's marvelous thank you <laughs> so thanks Stephen. To, uh, to have uh, so I actually met you here this is uh, <laughs> all the inspiration i was hoping for and looking for <laughs> and better and then at least my interpretation of what happened next was not that he just moved from, look, I was just giving you a hard time. Now let me encourage you. No, something else happened. I think he was leveling with me. That's what he was saying. I don't think he was, hey, here's the punch and now's the nice. I think he was saying, you know, do you understand how many people I talk to that just want to have a huge best-selling book? You know, do, do you understand how, that's like, Millions of people want that. And you're, you're just like all of them. You know, are you, are you really willing to go on the journey you need to go on? But in the pause that followed, it was like he listened to something. It's just, it was as if he just, he could feel something. And he just said, I won't go into everything he said, but the spirit of what he said next was like, you know what, who am I to say? Uh, maybe... Maybe the challenges in the world are so great and, you know, that the time to solve them is so short that you, that you really will have a mission uh, to, to teach and to, and to bless lives. And, 
and I found, I found both pieces of that interaction instructive. And they're both totally true um, in that moment. The, the reality of, well, to come back to a phrase we're using now, the reality of like you're rubbish at the beginning. You don't know anything. You don't know what you don't know. You're, you're going to be naive. Also with the reality of yes, but you have an essential mission to live. And if you can tap into that, if you can keep coming back to that, even if it was once a week that you got renewed in that idea, it can add up significantly over time and suddenly you can start to achieve a tremendous level of contribution. Um, not by doing what everyone else is doing. Oh, for heaven's sake, not doing what everybody else is doing. Uh, but doing just what you, your essential mission, coming back to what you are meant to do, built to do, came here to do. Uh, and, and so that's one of, that was the first interaction, but there were, there were many others. Amazing. Well, you know, the guy is, is phenomenal. And, uh, you know, that interaction with his daughter makes me think, you know, I think in that moment, I think that Covey really highlights and I think it's probably the reason why that story in the book gave me goosebumps is because that highlights, you know, really what's meaningful, you know, so often marketing and whatnot, it makes us think that these external things are, are, are the point, right? They think that, you know, the holidays and these things that they are the goal. But I wonder, this makes me think in your life, what are the things which have given you the most meaning? I was just interviewed uh, for an article uh, that was published in the New York Times called um, something like The Magic of Mundane Moments, something like that. And they were asking me a similar question that you asked. And it made me think about reading, rereading my old journals. So I, I've not been good at that. Actually, I've been pretty straight up rubbish about that. I write a journal really religiously, like hardly have missed a day in many, many years. Uh, but I don't often go back and rewrite, reread anything I've ri ri written from three years ago or five years ago. And so here there's a shelf of books in uh, at my home, these a journal being completed almost every 90 days, but they're just sitting there as this sort of untapped asset. Uh, and so as I started to go back and reread some of them, I was amazed at how many of the things I've written just didn't matter anymore. Uh, especially given the fact that the structure I use is like a gratitude journal. So I'm only trying to highlight the things I am grateful for that I think matter. That's what yeah. it is. But here, as I look back after a few years, I, I just thought entry after entry just didn't matter to me. I couldn't care less. And then every so often there would be an entry that was really precious to me. And one of them was um, a description of a game I had played with my daughter, who at the time probably was four years old or something. And I put in enough detail the kind of game we played and where we were when we played it and what she'd said and so on. It's just a short paragraph, but I was transformed, you know, transformed trends something uh, back to that moment. And I thought, you know, really it was the ordinary moment described in there that had become extraordinary to me given some hindsight, given some distance. And in that I find is quite an important lesson about not missing what matters. In pursuit of other things, in pursuit of various goals that you could miss the important stuff that's happening right this second, right where you are. Um, yeah. What, what would be an example of something which you thought mattered at the time but looking back, you realize that it actually didn't. Almost everything that I'd written about professional accomplishments 
on on a given day. I Just see, it, I see. it was amazingly unimportant, and I suppose it might feel a little rich to say that because you think, well, yeah, but if you if you don't achieve certain goals, okay, well then there isn't really the security to be able to have that game with my daughter, maybe right. So I mean, I suppose there is something about that that says, well, yes, you get to enjoy this moment because you're doing other things. Nevertheless, I was surprised at how trivial it now seemed you know so whereas i was celebrating oh well this company or this conference has asked me to speak in this place and so on and it it, it was clearly exciting to me that on that day and and i'm not i'm not then or now ungrateful about that i'm still grateful for it but it just isn't as important as it felt mm. uh so we've got to remember that it's not like some things are a little more important than other things. It's that some things are massively disproportionately important compared to other things. And that's the scale problem that I think a lot of people have that I try to teach with essentialism. Uh, I think a lot of people do have a basic logic that says, look, everything's approximately equal importance. And my job is basic productivity. It's to get as much from point A to point B like it's a coal mine or something. You could be careful with talking about coal mines and whether they're not important or whatever. I'm not saying coal mines aren't important, but just that, you know, that you're trying to get a set of stuff from point A to point B. But then essentialism's, one of its fundamental assumptions is that life is more like a diamond mine where you've got to explore and spend time in the exploration in search of a few things that are incredibly valuable. And so the difference would change how you go about your work. And same with the work of life, is that we're really in a diamond mine and our job is to make sure we're not missing the diamonds uh, because there's lots of forces that would try to distract us or attract us away from the things that actually matter most. I love that, I love that. Here's a um, question which has just come into my mind. So when I was negotiating with, I believe it was Lindsay to come onto the podcast, it made me think, what are some of the things that Greg, yourself, could do that would irritate Lindsay? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, there's all sorts of things. That <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, I'm a bit notoriously... Uh, a couple of minutes, uh, you know, late for interviews as I watch <laughs> this one. <laughs> and so I do check. I've actually been starting the most obvious thing, but I've started a habit um, of checking my calendar. I mean, you can imagine checking my calendar at night, first thing in the morning, and then through the day. Uh, just even those three check-ins because it's not actually my norm to do it. I, I, I'm so focused on like, hey, let's get on with this mission of this thing to do it's just not been a great habit for me of uh, making sure that i'm there so she will she will normally email me or or text me or call me right before an appointment <laughs> <laughs> that's got to be annoying she's never actually said it is but i mean how could it not be <laughs> fantastic fantastic the next question i've got for you is when i was thinking about you know the stories in the book you mentioned i mean I suppose just in essence, right, being an essentialist, by definition, you're going against the status quo, right? That takes bravery, you know, in a world in which busyness is so... What, what did you say? Bravery. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just, you know, in a world in which, you know, I suppose busyness has become, has become a fetish, right? And then I was combined this with some of your other stories. You moved from London to the States, Right. I mean, that takes courage. So I wonder, where does Greg McKeon's courage come from? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I feel like a, a courageous person. And what I think is interesting, too, about courage is I didn't set out to write a book about courage. And, but I do think you're right in having identified that sort of sitting underneath the rock of essentialism, you know, Courage is underneath there. Bravery is underneath there. So it's not how I got to the subject, but I do think it is there. Now, 
I think courage as a general rule feels pretty awful. Yeah, it's not like a, it's not like a, it's not like a happy emotion. You have to feel courage. You're like, you're battling fear, uh, or even terror with something. I mean, that's what you need the courage for is to, is to not take counsel from the fears uh, and, and all of that. And, and so the reason I, I set that up that way is because I don't feel courageous. <laughs> I don't feel awful. When I quit law school, I didn't feel, oh, this is, hold your breath, make it through, white knuckle it. <laughs> and, and nor in the, the journey since because of a sense of mission. And, and by that, I don't just mean a goal that you write down and then pursue. I mean something deeper than that, something that you detect rather than define. Actually, that's something that Stephen Covey said and I completely concur with, is that really, even though for all of the times he taught that you need to write a mission statement, what he really was trying to say and said to me was, a mission isn't something you write, it's something you detect. It's something that has to be, now my words, not his, discerned, discovered, not just chosen from out there and written down. So it's about being able to feel that clarity inside of you uh, and to try to clear out the noise so that you can see that clearly. And once you do, once you have that clarity, it's so valuable because the yes is so clear for you mm. that of course you won't do what other people are doing. In, in, fact, I, in fact, I've had feedback since, I, I mean, even recently from my own family, uh, my family of origin that they observed I didn't care so much about what other people seemed to think about me or what my peers were doing when I was growing up. And I thought that was really interesting feedback because that isn't how I felt. Um, I, I seem to remember worrying about how I looked, how I came across or, you know, what, what all of that. But what they were observing, I think, is that that wasn't the dominant force, that there was something else that was more, more on fire to do something else. And I still do feel that. So it's, it's really more to do with, yeah, I feel conscious of, you know, how you might appear or whatever, and even worry about that. But it's not, but it has to be put into second place because there's a sense of mission that I feel, you know, fire for the deed to use Columbus's term, I've got fire for the deed in my life. And I, one of the things I feel fire for is that every person has such a deed to do. And so my, I love that conversation. I love to be able to bring that and remind people about that because I mean, talk about asymmetric risks. I mean, you, you, the, the risk that you don't want, the negative downside is to get to the end and go and discover, oh, yeah, did a lot of stuff. I did a lot of the Facebook stuff, but I didn't dis detect or do my essential mission. I came and went and I didn't do it. That is, is like the worst scenario. It's the worst risk. So the alternative is, well, let me start exploring that right now. Whatever I've been doing before, let's start exploring it. And when I was doing research for essentialism, I found that essentialists explore more than non-essentialists. They just commit to fewer things. And, and there's so many ways I fall short as an essentialist, but exploring what is essential is something that's like, you know, almost like my profession. Uh, it, 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 it's just constantly in the mode of, could it be this? Is this the, is this what I should be doing? Should I be doing this thing? And it's not indecision, it's exploration until I'm searching for the thing that's so completely, absolutely the right thing. I can go big into it and I can spend years on it. It's, it doesn't matter because you know, it's the right thing. And so as clarity increases, I suppose probably courage and bravery increase but I'm just not 
feeling that, and I'm not sure other people have to feel that either. Their clarity of purpose just consumes them, and and fear like is put in its place. It doesn't matter. I think that's that's where that's where the strength comes from to say yes to what matters and no to what doesn't. And I guess that you know I suppose linking in what you said with the end of the book, right? I mean, you talk about in this in the book this idea of JOMO, joy of missing out, and I love this idea so much. And it wasn't until I read the book that I think you know what it's like. Man, there are a lot of nights out which I didn't go on. There are you know some trips you know with partying trips and festival trips with my friends that I didn't go on, and I'm like, man, you know, I'm grateful for those. You know, could you talk about this idea? So it's interesting. I was just talking actually talking for the podcast and the essentials and podcast with the person who came up with coined the term FOMO right like he was the first person before him that term did not exist on the internet and now it's in the dictionary that's sort of a pretty good like drop the mic moment isn't it like the, who, are you, who are you well I came up with this term it, it, and now it's in the dictionary and he's still you know young fellow so it was interesting talking to him I, you know, let's just back up FOMO, of course, the fear of missing out. It's not just social media. It's just the fear of not doing, of, of there's something better out there I should be doing. Someone is doing something better than me right now. And so even in a, even an effort to optimize based on other, is, is, it becomes sort of impractical or in, even impossible. So you're unhappy constantly in your choice because you should be somewhere else. In fact, I, I've, I've been to um, I've been to Davos a few times, which itself sounds so name dropping, but it, it still is it sort of important to illustrate the point, which is okay. Now you've been invited to one of the exclusive parties of the world, right? I mean, like you're there now, man. You've arrived now, and you get there, and the entire time, the sensation palpably everywhere is that you're not in the right place. That the right place is through that door over there. They're, they're having a meeting over there. It's like, a, it's like an experience of being an inception. Oh. You, you know, like there's always a dream within a dream. There's always a <laughs> within a meeting. And whatever door you get into, however selective of a group you manage to go, well, the real party's over there, you know. And, and literally there are people, and not a few, and especially now that technology is what it is. I mean, there's all apps that people have been created informal apps and, and unofficial apps and, and they are they are where people can say where things are happening oh i'm at this party and so and so just arrived oh i'm at this place and so and so and there are people literally chasing between these different events trying to be where those people are and i just cannot do it i just first of all i just think i would lose that game i just don't i just don't see how i would like who wants to win? Who wants to try and play an unwinnable game? Yeah. That doesn't appeal to me anyway. I don't want to have a, a red ocean strategy, you know, from you know, the metaphor, right, where everyone's fighting over the same fish, and so the ocean's red with the blood of everyone. Mm. I, I'd much prefer a blue ocean strategy for my life, um, where you're finding a different approach. And so. Um, at, at one of the World Economic Forum events I went to, I felt meeting fatigue. We've been in meetings after meetings, and I just, I just was like, and it wasn't bad time at all, uh, but I still just was in fatigue. So I said, okay, I'm just going to head to the, go to the pool. Uh, you know, a little, little, little embarrassed, a little, you know, trying to. I don't want to. I get there, and there's probably 20 or 30 other people have had the same idea, and that's where something magic started to happen. It was like, it was, it was walking away from where everybody thought the action was happening and just enjoying being there with whoever was there. That all these interesting connections did happen between the people there that were just hanging out and relaxed together. And, and the more I've done both that and other kinds of events, you know, in a similar vein, I have just found like most of the normal rules just I'm not interested in and don't apply. I just don't think they're the best approach. You just be interested in who you are talking to. Don't at these events stand there looking over the shoulder. Like, who else is in the room? Who else is here? It's just be there with the person you're with. 
and don't try to pretend you're better than you are and don't try to be like everybody else with the, the, the fancy suits and the fancy ties and everything's all right. That I mean, the guy that taught me most about how to, how to do there uh, is, um, it, it, it goes by Mr. Davos actually, he's done it every year for, forever. And he said he, he likes to make a bad impression. <laughs> Think of that. That's really genuinely true. Says, I like to make a bad impression. Is that because everybody else is trying to look completely professional, completely put together. Of course, they've done their hair. Of course, they're, look, they're wearing all the designer stuff. And so as a result, they're completely invisible, completely forgettable. And he said, he said he just goes the other direction. He's just completely himself. He's completely raw. He doesn't mind if people even find him slightly irritating when they meet him because at least they remember him. And at least then it's the beginning of a proper relationship rather than all this fakery. And I suppose, you know, it comes back to the thing. It's like, you know, how do you feel when you're by yourself, right? It's like, you know, you go to one of those conferences and you try to be someone you're not, and then you got to go home and, you know, like live with yourself, you yeah. know? So, man, I love that strategy. But I, I want to talk with you about um, essentialism as a decision-making tool, right? So I think that one of the quotes in the book off the top of my head, which, man, I think, you know, Sorry, Shane Parrish, but this is the only mental model you need. If there yeah. isn't a clear yes, then it's a hell no. Man, could you yeah. talk about this as a decision-making model? Yeah, I like that you're clarifying it that way because, because in fact, I remember asking um, the essentialist community to say, to say, okay, if you had to summarize essentialism in one sentence, what would your sentence be? Mm. And I so lots of great answers, but one of them, is a line from the book, but one decision that makes a thousand decisions. Love it. And I do think they, that they had, it was from a friend, Jade Coyle, who's the one that, that, that selected that out of the option, you know, out of all of the things he could have said. And, and I thought, I think that's it. it. It's, you're looking for the one thing that's so valuable, so important to you, that it helps you to simplify all of your other decisions in this area. So, I mean, at a life level, it's saying, okay, let me get the basic prioritization of my life right. Uh, I've been writing about this recently, but this week, uh, sort of thinking about it like priority circles. So this is like the simplest idea in the world. What most people do is they put all the other stuff, the non-essential stuff first. Then whatever is available after that, whatever's left over, okay, family and close relationships, they get the next, whatever's left over. And if there's anything after that that's left over, it's, you know, it's protecting the asset. It's, it's looking after yourself. It's your own mental, emotional, and spiritual, physical health. But really, because of the order, there's hardly anything left for that. And I just think if you could, it's like exactly the opposite. You've got to put protecting the asset at the center of, your, your life prioritization model. Uh, that, that is to protect the ability to prioritize. So that means basic physical health, right? Sleeping enough, drinking enough water, doing some basic exercise. I mean, basic things, but just doing them, really actually doing them. It means uh, mentally reading from the best literature, you know, the, the most inspiring, most uh, ennobling, enabling work so that you're constantly educating and cleansing your own conscience, your own sense of, uh, you know, your own navigational intelligence is getting cleansed every so often by being connected to the very best that's been written. Uh, you know, you're doing these things so that you can discern what matters and what doesn't. So that reinforces then that your most important relationships really ought to get the next level of investment. And you're, you show up to them in a good way because you've invested uh, first in protecting your own asset. And then of course, what it means is when you are that way healthy and your family relationships are strong, you are in a place to be able to really focus on the other projects out there and your ability to figure out what the most important projects are has increased. So what you find is if you can simply get that order right, if you can reverse, you know, switch between that non-essential model to an essential model, that 
you will you have the opportunity to succeed personally and with the people that matter most to you and to make a contribution out into the world and it, it works but if you get the order wrong you will often end up sort of fouling out on some of the professional stuff and you don't have great relationships and your health is being diminished so you can end up getting none of it and it's all simply about getting the prioritization order correct you know i love this this concept you know it's, it seems like relationships and meaning has been such a present theme throughout this so i suppose my question to you on this would be greg what would be some investments that you make that you never regret making yeah well that's a really cool question uh you know identifying it in that way that you never regret i mean one thing that's too general to be to be satisfying to me as an answer for your question but one is like just choosing to become an essentialist right you never <laughs> ever regret that like you know on your deathbed you just you're never going to say oh i just wish i'd been more of a non-essentialist i wish i just spent more time <laughs> you know, fooling around on facebook uh, and just you know just just purposely purpose purposelessness should have been you know, you're never going to say that so like first of all that's one thing i think you can safely walk down you can open that door confident that there's very low downside very high upside let's talk about specific things um yeah i never regret taking a nap <laughs> <laughs> i didn't expect that answer yeah, <laughs> yeah. Expect never that. regret that i don't know anyone who regrets that you know even if you go oh, i've got work to do i've got things to deliver on and then you just oh, i'm tired i'm gonna go take a nap after you take that nap you're just like superman right you're like i can do so much better now and i can see which things i don't need to even worry about now bother with and do the important work instead uh, I, I would say that's one thing for sure uh, I would say um, investing in like a, a proper um, microburst planning session with my wife Anna I never regret right so even if you say okay 10-15 minutes what do we think really matters today let's get it synced up that is such high value uh, add work uh, another thing is once a week uh, I do a, um, a sort of weekly review, but it's like a gratitude review where I'm looking through my journal entries and selecting and saying, okay, what out across the course of a week, what things have really mattered most to me? And that is so satisfying, but also perspective uh, correcting uh, in helping me to see what's going right, what's working uh, and what I can build on the next week. Um, I would say one-on-one -on -one time with each of my children. You never, you never regret doing that. Uh, so I travel with my children. We have eighty percent of the time I'll bring one of my kids with me, uh, and, and that just always enriches. I mean, I mean, actually, on one of those trips, you get more one-on-one -on -one time than probably a month or even sometimes six months of yeah. normal life, uh, because you're just with each other the entire time and. And, and it's just much more relaxed experience to be together. And we've made so many memories, I mean, all over the world now. So it's added up, uh, added up a lot. Um, okay, those are some answers to your, to your question. <laughs> I love that. I've just got uh, maybe two more questions left before we just get you to sign off and just tell our audience where they can connect with you. Um, so I think the hardest part of becoming an essentialist for me is I mean, growing up, I was always, you know, as I, I, I'm a people pleaser. You know, I like, I like to see other people happy, right? I mean, my co-host, Lewis, this guy is pestering me all the time for things, <laughs> you know, which is good because obviously, I mean, we push each other. But I mean, man, sometimes I just need to put my phone on airplane mode for, you know, a month or so just to <laughs> get some peace of mind. And I know you target this in the book, but I wonder... Um, how you would approach a subject like saying no, because I suppose, especially when it's someone you care about, like say like, you know, my business partner, Lewis, right. It's like, I suppose the closer they are, the harder it becomes. So how, what sort of methodologies or frameworks do you have for this? Um, something that an experience I had that I, I hadn't had when I wrote essentialism, but <clears throat> I wish I had, cause I'd have liked to have put it in there was, 
one of my daughters who, as I already mentioned, they travel with me. And so that means they have actually attended lots of essentialism workshops and keynotes. And, and they're not just, you know, they're, they're not just there, they like participate. They, you know, they'll answer questions and take notes and participate in the exercises and all of this. And uh, so I'm saying that because it may have had an effect upon this experience. Uh, I was trying to persuade her to read a book. I'm sure it was something that I thought was a good idea and she reads a lot. Uh, I mean, she didn't want to read it. And we didn't have some big argument um, at all, but she just was pushing back. And I came to the office here and was doing some meeting and she slipped a note under the door uh, and I have it somewhere. I, was, I, I carried it with me for a little while and then somebody, when I was speaking, they said, uh, they said we've got to lam laminate this, we've got to protect it. So that's why it's laminated now. But here it is, this is what she wrote. She said, I already expressed my unwillingness to read this book but I'm willing to make a counter offer. I am not willing to read it all, one, all in one day today, but I'd be happy to explore the possibility of reading it in the future over the course of a few weeks. <laughs> I believe it would be best to wait till the end of my literature assignment. If you would like me to read this book in place of a separate assignment and over the course of a few weeks, I'm sure that can be made possible. <laughs> Well, how old is his daughter? She was 14 when she wrote She that. was 14? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, and, and so to me, there's a, lot, there's a lot in that little story, right? There's, there's, um, there's what essentialism looks like, first of all, because essentialism isn't a solo sport. It's like culture or nothing. You want to have it become the norm for everybody involved. It's not just, oh, I'm the boss. And I will say no to a thousand things, say yes to the one thing that I want to do. It's like, it's the healthy way of operating mm. with any relationship. Where if you think you, all you have in a relationship is two options, a polite yes uh, or rude no, right? If those are your only two options. And first of all, you're going to bound to be doing more polite yeses than rude noes. But either way, you're trapped. Yes. Uh, and it's not a healthy relationship. But if you can discover that you can negotiate essentials, and in fact, this is the only really viable long-term solution for a good relationship, is to be able to talk about the trade-offs. I need you to do this, this, and this. Okay, well, let's talk about it. Let's look at what really, what, what can I do today? How... Is this the most important thing? Let me share what I think might be the most important thing. Let's get clear about what we really want to be doing. What are our key projects? What are the things that just should be put on hold completely or eliminated? Like this is the conversation. And you've got to create enough psychological safety in those relationships to be able to have these conversations so that you can actually invest your time on what matters most, what's most useful, and not simply, uh, you know, try to cram everything in that everybody wants you to do. It's like Covey's win-win, bringing it back to the main man, right? Win-win relationships. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, the way that that aligns is that, you know, the first principle of, of the win-win agreement is to, is to come to a clear desired uh, result. And I remember working with somebody um, who was really different to me culturally. This was on a volunteer mission that I was on many years ago. And, and it, 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 you got paired up with somebody. You'd actually sort of live with them for two, three, four months maybe. And you didn't know each other at all before. So you're like, <laughs> and you're with them all the time. Like, it's not like just your, not just your roommates. I mean, you just are like together companions for like all the time. And frankly, I'll be honest with you, he, he, he didn't want to be assigned to me. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah, it wasn't like a, it wasn't personal it was that he didn't know me, but he just was like the whole approach, the way I would do things is so different than this English, but he would see, it just was assumptions around how it would be. And so the first conversation I had with him, we didn't do anything formal. It had been, it had been weird, we were in like 19 at the time, but, but I just said, hey, listen, can we just talk about like what our goal is, like what we want to do together? What, what? And we agreed on like one objective. And we also just then had a discussion about what things wouldn't we want to do and how, how would you not like to go about it? And, 
he identified something right in that first half hour conversation, like when we, when we were talking, that he never wanted to do. And I was like, well, that's fine. I can, we can, I can agree on that. And it led to the most productive, fantastic next two months together because we were clear about what we were trying to do. We shared the same goal and we also knew, you know, had a, a couple of boundaries. I love that, that word made it work for us right some boundaries that, that okay i'm okay with this but i'm not okay with that and so on and getting that up front meant that we were able to just really enjoy being together even though we're completely different temperaments and temperaments and cultural backgrounds and whatever else i love that i love that so i think this has been fantastic i got one more question yeah. but because i know you would have done a million of these i want to give you a choice of which question you answer yeah, okay. So question number one would be, what would be one thing that you wish everybody could take away from the book? Or question number two would be, what things in your life bring Greg closer to the light? Uh, yeah, I'd take the second question for sure. Because um, that's it, right? That's what it's all about is, you know, with, with Anna and I, with our children, for example, you know, we, we think there's like one goal. Mm. And the goal is to help each of our children be able to feel, recognize, and follow their conscience. <laughs> I love it. And we further think that if they can, that's the end of parenting. Right, like the primary function of parenting is done. And that doesn't mean we disappear completely, but it means you can change your role. Because your role is no longer directing, your role is just supporting and encouraging. And our experience is that this can happen young. So it's not even something that, well, okay, when you're 18, when you're 25, when you know something, then you'll be all right. No. We don't want somebody to be 25 or 30 before they start doing this. We're going to teach them when they're three, four, five, six. By the time they're 10, 12, they might have insight, light that, uh, that, that will guide them for years and years to come. And another note slipped under our doors. Everything's by notes, apparently, in our house. Um, was, uh, was when my eldest was 10 years old and she slipped a note under my door. Uh, she'd stayed up late. She had a brainstorming time. And she had really been wrestling with some of these big questions, some in essentialism and, and some not written there, but like, what's my hundred year vision? That's literally what one of the questions. Was <laughs> <laughs> so she, she, she'd been wrestling with this. And it's brilliant brainstorm sheet of paper and she had discovered and she'd circled it many times. She'd realized that she, what she wanted to do was to be a director. Uh, and that this was, and that she couldn't believe the discovery because she really wanted to do it since she could remember literally from five years old, but she didn't have a word for it. Now she had discovered it. And so here we are now she graduated high school early and 16 or something here, which is early for the U S and, and so she's been at community college for the last year. And she's just, this is what she's doing. She's doing directorial work. And so, and, and, and she's been able to do all these internships way younger than she normally would because she got that clarity early. And you see, it's like really, truly one decision that makes a thousand. Yeah. And so as a parent, that's my job. I want her to be able to be led not by me, right? That's not, the end goal isn't do what mum and dad want. The end goal is you are being guided by something better than mum and dad. And so if that can happen, then, then you'll grow and grow in that principle of light. And that will become the the dominant force and that your work of life and mine and you literally and everyone listening to this is to keep coming back to that light and whatever brings you closer to it, it takes you away from it. Uh, I mean, mindless, mindless social media work past midnight, that is not going to take you to the light. <laughs> that, that's for sure. Uh, I don't generally make a list of things for other people because I don't want to be presumptuous, but, you know, for me, it's, it's definitely, you know, it's the journaling, it's, it's meditating, it's praying, it's, uh, 
uh, reading the best wisdom literature I possibly can. It's protecting that as the most important of the personal assets. And so if you have to get the red hot center of that priority circle, it's, it's completely about light and, 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 and tapping into it and coming to it and being humble enough to hear it and not fighting against it. Uh, and somehow this always seems to know what, what is essential. Amazing. Greg, where can our audience connect with you and do you have any closing messages for them? Um, you, you know, places they can connect. I mean, the, I, I know we already mentioned it, but I, I am really particularly excited about the podcast. So, you know, go subscribe uh, wherever you subscribe to your podcast uh, and uh, get a design partner to come along with you so that you can carry on the conversation after the podcast is over each week. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter uh, at essentialism.com. Uh, and, uh, and that's another place where we'll be continuing the conversation and providing resources. Uh, so we start with that, start with those.